only Luke recounts how our Lord was followed by a large crowd as he carried his cross to Calvary, a crowd in which many women were mourning for him. That scene is movingly portrayed by Pietro Lorenzetti in a series of frescoes relating the passion story, which he painted in the Lower Basilica at Assisi, probably sometime around 1318. The size of the crowd is mediated not by the number of figures, but their tightly packed composition. Not one of them seen in full, and the head of one, scarcely visible at all, behind John the beloved disciple and a saintly female figure. A soldier with his back to us pushes or holds back the Blessed Virgin with his shield as the crowd presses forward. The gestures of these holy men and women communicate their grief. John has one hand to his face. Beside him, one of the Marys holds her mantle to her mouth as though stifling a cry. It is perhaps Mary Magdalene who pulls at her own hair. The Virgin has her hands crossed over her chest in humble sorrow. This is a grief that we are invited to share, a compassion with which to unite ourselves with the crucified Lord. A crowd had earlier led him into the city. Lorenzetti painted that scene as well. At its centre, Jesus rides towards the city gateway, dressed in a rich blue mantle, with his right hand held out in blessing. The band of male disciples advances close behind him, the inhabitants of Jerusalem spilling out of the city to meet him. Some throw off their cloaks for him to enter over. It's a scene of peaceful triumph but we cannot fail to notice that the two disciples nearest to Christ are Judas, the betrayer, and probably St. Peter, the apostle who will deny Christ three times. There are two dynamics at work, the onward movement of salvation history to its ultimate victory, but also intertwined with it, the latent dynamic of human sinfulness. If we now turn back to the scene of Christ being led away to crucifixion, we can observe that our Lord is still at the centre of the fresco, but this time in a simple tunic, carrying his cross on foot behind the two condemned thieves, already stripped of their outer garments ready for execution. There's a silent dignity, a firm resolve on the part of Jesus. He has embraced and shouldered his cross. He looks straight ahead. There is no sign as yet that he is crushed by the weight of the cross. Can we too square up to the demands of love? Not without his grace, but with that grace, in the power of the Spirit. The condemned thieves ahead of Jesus and the guards to the right of the scene are depicted as smaller than he is, or than the other saints behind him. It's a sign of a person's spiritual stature or its absence. But we may note that there is now no glimpse of Judas and Peter, nor of the other apostles, with the exception of the beloved disciple. The three Marys, and perhaps another female saint whom we cannot really see, have taken their place. The two missing men are united in failing the Lord, but will have very different fates, as only one finds the courage and humility to repent. In contrast to the grieving women, the latent violence of the scene is mediated through the framing of the mounted soldiers the fierce heads of the horses at the back of the crowd, and the horse rearing up at the far right of the fresco as another soldier leans round and points to Christ with his sword. 
Now, all this is well and good, yet it's not quite what Luke relates, or not all that he relates. Where Lorenzetti fills the crowd with saints, the Gospel writer gives no such clue. Luke's crowd follow Jesus out, but not necessarily as sainted disciples. The ritual stages of this cruel execution draw them on, stir them. We might think of these women at first as a Greek chorus, dignifying the imminent death of Jesus with their threnody, but also anticipating that death, stressing its inevitability. Yet suddenly, the scene changes dramatically as the Christ, we're told, turns and confronts them. So what's happening here? Artists have rarely portrayed this moment, this turn. It interrupts the powerful onward movement of the narrative, the expulsion of Jesus from the city to Calvary. In his stations for Westminster Cathedral, Eric Gill, Dominican tertiary, dissolved the problem by placing three women in front of our Lord. Two with their hands clasped in prayer, the third kneeling, while his left hand appears raised in blessing or warning. The title beneath reads, Jesus comforts the women of Jerusalem. And the space between Jesus and the women is filled, it's crammed with the Latin text of our Lord's words. But is what he says any comfort? Our band of women, or chorus of spectators, is addressed as the daughters of Jerusalem. They are confronted with the destruction that is soon to fall on their city, on them and on their children. If they thought it was safe to watch and weep as spectators, they must now learn that they too are caught up in the unfolding drama of good and evil. Such are the forces at work that those who in other times were thought accursed, the barren, the childless, would instead be counted blessed. If the Lord's death is inevitable, there's no escape for them either from the suffering to come. Some comfort, you might think. Well, this may be one of the less successful of Gill's stations, an unhappy compromise between the gospel account and the medieval portrayal that turns the women into sainted disciples. What about here? In his stations for Blackfriars Oxford, Father Aylred Whitaker kept much the same composition as Gill, but replaced the kneeling woman with a crouching child or toddler while the Christ is shown without Simon of Cyrene, his back curved by the weight of the cross, the hand perhaps still raised in blessing, but weaker. Father Elred also removed the long gospel text and changed the title to the plainer, the more ambiguous text, he speaks to the women. But the child's prayer-like gesture carried forward and upwards by the horizontal beam of the cross, creates a strong diagonal connecting heaven and earth. God and humankind connected through the passion of our Lord and Saviour. The station Father Aylred carved for the Dominican Priory at Stellenbosch in South Africa makes the even bolder move of having the child raised up to Christ by the mother whereupon Jesus takes him like an offering, one sacrifice met by another. There the plain title reads, He Meets the Women. What about us? Where do we fit into these different versions of the scene? Do we too imagine that we can be spectators, that our lives are not caught up in the cosmic battle between good and evil? History offers no such hope, nor does the Lord himself. We might think of the countless women 
who have suffered the death of loved ones through warfare or suffered death themselves as so many civilian casualties, the many victims in so-called drug wars or of gangland violence, or those who have been caught up and cruelly exploited, enslaved in people trafficking. What we hope for is not to avoid suffering, but for our suffering to be redeemed. Can we not meet the Lord this Lent? Let the Lord meet and speak with us through the compassionate practice of our faith, through repentance and sacramental confession, through our receiving Holy Communion. The Lord offers up his life, his all for us. We can offer him our loving thanks and praise. <laughs>